Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Lauren Bryant, and I'm the project manager for the Back Bay Fens Pathways Project for Boston Parks. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, I just want to go over a few how-tos and what to expect tonight. Um, we did not have any requests for interpretation for tonight's meeting, so the meeting tonight is going to be in English only. Um, we do want to be able to hear all voices, and we're able to offer translation and interpretation services free of charge when they're requested. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in for future meetings, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N dot Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T at boston.gov. And I'll put that in the chat for you guys in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Also wanna make sure that you all know that tonight's meeting is being recorded and it's gonna be available on the project website within about a week or so. Um, this is what we've done on all of our other meetings as well. So if you've missed any of the past ones, you can always go back to the project website and see those as well. Um, and if you have any friends or neighbors who aren't able to join tonight, please feel free to let them know and they can check that out as well. Um, I'll also put the project website in the chat for you guys in a minute as well. Um, we want to make sure that we hear your thoughts tonight. That's why we're here. Um, so there are going to be several ways that you can engage with us tonight. Um, we're going to be sharing the presentation, and then we're going to have an open discussion at the end. Plus, we have our chat function, so you can always add comments or put questions into the chat as we go. Um, if you um, aren't familiar with Zoom, the chat function, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's an icon with three dots with the word more next to it. Under that, you'll find the chat, so you can click on that if you want to. Um, and if you um, want to be able to uh, speak during our discussion portion of the evening, we'd like you guys to be able to unmute and share your thoughts with us. So please click on the reactions icon at the bottom of the screen, and that will allow you to raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to speak. Hopefully that takes care of all the housekeeping. Um, so now onto the project. Uh, first tonight, we're gonna introduce our project team. We're gonna do a quick project overview and a summary of where we are in the project. Um, and then we're gonna share a presentation on design updates since the last time we all met. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for discussion and questions um, and finish with talking through the next steps of our project. Um, for anybody that joined late, uh, my name is Lauren Bryant and I'm the project manager for Boston Parks for this project. Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture is our design firm for the project, and Kyle is going to be leading the presentation tonight, and he's joined by Jay, Rob, and Mike from his office. I know we've shared this diagram at several of our meetings, um, but because I know we have some new faces here tonight, I just wanted to share it again. We tend to get asked um, quite often what goes into decision making during a park design project. Um, so we take a lot of things into consideration as we move through the projects. Um, things like community input, such as the meeting tonight or emails that we get from constituents, or even when you know Kyle and I are out walking around the site, the conversations that we have with users of the park when we're there, all of that we take in because you guys know this park so well um, and your input is incredibly important to us. Um, we factor in City of Boston priorities and parks and recreation goals, um, and we're also bound by safety and regulatory guidelines, such as ADA or landmarks um, or Conservation Commission. So all of that goes into that decision-making process. And because it's been a while since we talked last, um, we just wanted to take the opportunity to kind of provide an update as to where we are in this big timeline of this project and to also share what we've been working on since we talked last. Um, so we first started these conversations um, October of last year, um, and we're nearing the point of finalizing the designs and moving into the permitting and construction documentation phase of the work, and that's gonna happen over this winter. Um, and part of that is we're going to talk about some of the design decisions that have been made and progressed because of the input we've heard from you, um, and we want to share those with you tonight to make sure that we've heard you, that we're getting it right, that this feels like the direction we should be moving in the park. Um, so once we are able to finalize some of those thoughts with you all tonight, um, we'll be able to start to move into that next phase of work. 
Um, so then also just wanted to reiterate that the current estimate is $6,500,000. And that's what's in the capital plan for the city. And we know that this is going to go up as we finalize some of the added items that have come into the project, like the O'Reilly um, Monument, the World War II Memorial, Evans Wade Bridge. All of those are going to have some outside funding, whether they be CPA or the White Fund and some private donations, probably for the bridge as well. So once those um, items are finalized, we can give you a final total. But right now, our estimate for the pathways portions is $6,500,000. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. Oh, no, I'm not. I've got one more slide. So one of the things that we wanted to share is um, this project, as you guys know, just has, it touches so many people and so many organizations that we wanted to share who all we've been coordinating with in addition to the community. So I'm not going to sit here and read it all to you, um, but you can see there's quite a few people here. Um, we've been doing a lot of coordination recently with the Veterans Commission in terms of the World War II um, Memorial. We've done a lot of working with the Disabilities Commission, especially around that memorial, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, we're working with ComCom and Landmarks on how all of this stuff ties together, but we just wanna make sure you know we're not looking at this project in a bubble and that we are coordinating with all of these groups and organizations as well. And now I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to Kyle. All right, thanks, Lauren. I'm Kyle Zick, a landscape architect with KZLA. So the Bank Bay Fins Pathway Project, we want to just kind of boil it down for you. You know, what are we trying to do? We're focusing on pathways, as the title indicates. And with that, we're going to be looking at accessibility. You know, how are the paths used um, or not used? How do we manage stormwater? What are the appropriate materials? And how do we make all of this have longevity? So just for orientation, um, this is the Back Bay Fens Park. We've got the Fenway on the lower side. You've got Park Drive, Agassiz Road cutting through. Uh, Museum of Fine Arts is here. And then just some of the park landmarks itself, you have Clemente Field. You've got the Rose Garden, the War Memorial, Mother's Rest, the Victory Gardens. And there's others here. I mean, there's many, many, many. So um, those are just kind of general for orientation. We're also going to talk about um, bridges. The Evansway Bridge is here at number 17. And then we have two other pedestrian bridges, the southern one at 16 and the northern one at 15. And then the Agassiz Bridge um, is one that we'll refer to as well. This project requires a little bit of explanation um, on a lot of levels, part of it on land ownership. The pathways we're talking about generally are within the city of Boston part of the project. So it's not as simple as you think. Um, the Muddy River is the blue line running through the middle of the site. The orange is city of Boston owned. Kyle, I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. There's someone in the chat that's saying that they can't see and that the screen is black. I can see what's on there. Could anyone else let me know with a thumbs up or some kind of a, um, hand raised if you can see the screen or in a chat. I can see it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try to see if we can just really quickly, I'm sorry, everybody, to see if we can um, help problem solve for Diane real quick. Diane, I'm going to ask you to unmute and then see if we can talk you through this. We just want to make sure you can see too. Diane, are you able to unmute? I granted her um, access to unmute. She, should be, she okay. should be able to unmute now. Diane, can you let us know if you can unmute and also to see if we can make sure you see now? It says the host has unmuted you. Okay, can you, so you just see a black screen and that's it? Correct. Okay, so if you go down to where the more is with the three dots, um, let's see. Nope, that's not what I'm looking at. When I press the more, it says stop incoming video.
you may have to try. I use Chrome. What? I was going to say, you might have to try to leave the Zoom and come back, like, as a refresh. Okay. All right. Okay. Do you want to try that, and then we can see if that works when you jump back in? Thanks, everybody. Sorry about that. So um, I think I was talking about the the gray area here, which is owned by the Boston Trust Office. That's where the War Memorial is. And then the darker orange color that rings the whole park is owned by the state Department of Conservation and Recreation. So it makes things a little complicated, but we've been in communication with the Trust Office and DCR throughout the project because we know we need to coordinate with them. Um, so how does that translate into pathways? So same color coding. This is every path that's in the park now. Uh, color coded orange would be a city of Boston owned path. The red would be um, DCR. And then the gray would be the trust office. And in addition to just having multiple landowners, we also have um, environmental permitting that we need to be aware of because of the muddy river that runs through the park. So we have riverfront area associated with the muddy river. We have the green areas are uh, bordering vegetated wetlands, which have buffer zones. And then we have a floodplain as well, which is this dashed red line. So all of that says that almost every part of our project area is under the jurisdiction of the Massachusetts DEP and the Boston Conservation Commission. So the areas that wouldn't be would be uphill of the floodplain along Park Drive here, or a little bit of uphill near the, um, the Fenway. So then what is our pathway scope? Um, we, we've looked at every single pathway within the park, DCR owned, Boston owned, trust office owned, and not every path needs to be reconstructed and for multiple reasons. So what you're seeing highlighted in red are paths that we are planning on reconstructing. If they're in green, the Army Corps rebuilt them as part of the Muddy River Phase Two project. And then the gold color on the outside are DCR paths. And then this kind of greenish beige color are paths that are in good condition and don't need to be replaced. And then take that one step further, only focusing on the paths in the Boston Park. The ones in the gold color are ones that we would repave or reconstruct basically in their current alignment. We might change the width, but the alignment's going to be the same. The ones highlighted in red, these smaller segments, are ones that are new paths. And why are we doing that? Mainly for accessibility. The southern footbridge, these two diagonal paths are to create an accessible route. Just west of there are two paths that are related to the circulation we're anticipating with the future Evans Way Bridge, but also it reflects desire lines that we see there now. Um, up here by the field house, this is a route that the maintenance vehicles take and wear a path into the um, lawn and earth. And in the Victory Gardens, these are paths leading to public gardens that would need to be accessible. And then also this V-shaped one is an accessible route navigating a big grade change. So then I'm going to go through the site in a bit more detail. So what I've been showing you so far are just very simple diagrams to explain the overall project. But now I'm going to zoom in um, and go through the park in like five or six different views. The Muddy River is the blue color here at the bottom. You've got the northern and southern footbridges the Kelleher Rose Garden and the War Memorial off to the side, Park Drive is at the top. Any path that has a gray color on it is one that we're rebuilding. And I'll differentiate if they're a new path in a new alignment or not. But I'll start with the paths. So generally, you know, we're repaving the paths going from the Northern Footbridge to Jersey Street and to Park Drive, and also out to Park Drive along uh, near the War Memorial. There are segments of path here that are not colored in gray that the Army Corps repaved fairly recently, so we don't need to redo those. But there are others that are colored here in gray are being redone, including two segments that I'm highlighting now, which are new path alignments. One 
because there's a desire line worn into the grass and there's no pavement there. So people are obviously trying to go there. And then this route that I'm highlighting, where we expect that with the Evans Way Bridge, that people will be trying to get to Jersey Street and that will be the best way for them to do that. So that covers the paths, but pathway projects are a lot more than just pathways. We're gonna look at trees, lighting, furnishings, and signage. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail on some of those, starting with lighting. One of the most heavily used paths in the park goes from Forsyth Street across the Northern Footbridge heading to Jersey Street. There's no lighting along that pathway, at least for this portion of it. So those orange dots are new lights that we would add because the lights right now go basically along the path that's near the Rose Garden. We would add lighting also to the path that leads to the proposed Evans Way Bridge because there's a destination here at the Jersey Street crossing. Lighting's not um, limited to just those pathways where um, the lighting is fairly out of date at this upper basketball court and we would add lighting for the lower basketball court so all that would be new and the lighting could be more efficient and more controlled and then we would replace the out-of-date lighting at the war memorial as well. Then I want to talk about furnishings. Um, benches, we've got a proposed bench here just toward the end of the rose garden that would have a view toward the river and then there's a bike rack added near the basketball courts. There's also a drinking fountain added there. I think there's a drinking fountain there now that doesn't work. And then planting, you'll see some green circles here between Clemente Field and the basketball court. That's trying to one, add more tree canopy, but providing a separation from these more active uses in a historic park. So I'll keep going. You'll, you'll see as we make our way counterclockwise around the park. Clemente Field is to the right here. This is the field house. The Muddy River is blue and the Fenway is on the left-hand side and Park Drive is to the top. So again, the gray colored paths are ones we're reconstructing. Those red dots are proposed lights which are leading to the Evans Way Bridge which you'll see in the next slide. The gray colored image um, paths up here between Park Drive and the field house are being regraded and repaved to provide accessible routes and to reinforce the way the maintenance vehicles come in here to serve this area. Similarly, on the Fenway side of the river, you're seeing some red lines here along the gray path. We're regrading that to be accessible. So all of these areas that I'm circling now are being redone to make have accessible paths in the park. This gold color that I'm highlighting is an area of meadow that I think is a little bit spontaneous that happened with this area being fenced off for the Army Corps project. But we think it's a good opportunity to not to um, have a little more biodiversity and not just have turf grass as some of the ground plane vegetation. Benches, um, I should also mention, adding a bench here uh, along this concrete pathway with a good uh, river view Similar to the other side of the river, we have two locations for benches. As we start to head down the Fenway side, you again see the Muddy River coming through here. You've got the Southern Footbridge that exists and then the proposed Evansway Bridge. We've already talked about the new path that would lead to the bridge and the pathway lighting that goes with it. As that bridge lands, we will regrade and repave the pathway. Um, on the Fenway side. We would also add a bike rack and lighting on the Fenway side of the bridge. You'll see a few more benches proposed here, those red rectangles. And then the pathway here at the Southern Footbridge, if you all know this park, you know as you cross the Fenway here, you go down, down a steep hill with loose gravel. And it's probably one of the, it's the biggest challenges, you know, as part of this project to, to make that better let alone make it accessible. But the direct route that you all walk, um, we would add stairs, make that stabilized, and you could still have the direct route. But there would be an accessible route that would go diagonally, that would meet this lower stone dust path, and then diagonally the other direction back to the footpath. So there's an accessible route um, connecting up to the Fenway and to the footbridge, and no trees have to be removed to do that. Mentioned meadow um, 
on the last slide, there's also a big swath here on that bank between the two path levels that um, could also be taller grasses. I think there's a lot of goldenrod in there as well. So then the northern footbridge is on the very left edge here. The uh, Muddy River is easy to see. The War Memorial, which we'll talk about in more detail, is here. And then the Fenway is on the lower side of the image. The northern footbridge is a little easier to make accessible. It's not accessible today, but with a little bit of regrading and adding handrails on either side of a portion of this path, it will be completely compliant. And we thought that was a simpler and better more direct solution than trying to do some diagonal paths that would um, not require handrails. We are replacing some benches um, in this area. They're the ones highlighted in gold, um, existing benches that are out of date, concrete and wood. And then there's a proposed new bench as well. Um, if you recall where the um, contractors trailers were about that location just before you get to Agassiz Road. Then we've come up the Fenway to where it meets Boylston Street. We've got the O'Reilly Memorial and Mother's Rest. Mother's Rest, the playground itself, will not be um, touched as part of this work, although we can um, improve access to it by redoing the pathways, um, including one portion of it that isn't accessible currently. Those red lines indicate where we're doing some regrading. We would add a bike rack near Mother's Rest. And there's opportunity to add another bench here with a, another good water view now that the Phragmites has been managed. I'll talk more specifically about the O'Reilly Memorial as a separate slide. Then we've come almost full circle. Uh, the focus of this slide is the Fenway Victory Gardens. You have the Muddy River here on the right-hand side, Boylston and Park Drive on the top. All the gray colored pathways are ones that would be reconstructed. Uh, I have another diagram about the Victory Gardens where I'll get into more detail in terms of materials and pathway width and that kind of thing. All right, so we talked about lighting as we went through those plans in detail, but this is a simple diagram that explains that as well. So back to the overall Back Bay Fens diagram, um, the yellow color and yellow dots are existing lights, but the red dots are ones that we would add reinforcing that Evans Way path to Jersey Street and that diagonal path from the northern footbridge toward Jersey Street. So those would be lit. The idea is that if you wanna cross the park at night, there is a lit path to get there. So it would be Evans Way Bridge to Jersey, Jersey to Forsyth and Agassiz Road. And then you can go around the perimeter very easily as well. The purple dots are the ones where we would update the lighting at the basketball courts and the War Memorial. Tree inventory. So as part of this project, we hired a certified arborist to inventory the trees along the pathways. And I said that specifically because um, there's already the Emerald Necklace Conservancy had a tree inventory done of all the Emerald Necklace parks several years ago. But so we've updated, had the same arborist update that information along the pathways. So if there's a color, green, yellow, orange, or red, on one of these circles indicating a tree location, that's an updated inventory tree. If it's gray, it had been inventoried previously and it's not immediately adjacent to a pathway, we don't need it, we didn't need to update the information. So then in terms of what are you seeing, the, this is summarizing the condition assessment. So green is good, fair is yellow, poor is orange, and red is dead. So um, there's good news and bad news here, but we're gonna be looking at each one of these trees also with the Boston Parks Arborist to be able to better determine, you know, what is the scope for tree pruning? Is the removal of dead trees and those kind of things. So then we can also think about a tree replacement um, recommendation. So then the Victory Gardens we're gonna focus on. Oh, Lauren, did you need? Kyle, um could we jump back to the lighting diagram? There were a couple questions in the chat, um, if we could. Um, one of the questions was, does existing light pole allow for a change in the nature of the lighting fixture itself? Was one of the questions. So um, it depends. Like um, this pathway going from the Northern Footbridge toward Park Drive, that is a Boston street lighting standard light. So it's a cast iron pole with an acorn top. And that is one of the standard light fixtures that street lighting allows. 
Um, it's not the only type of light fixture out here. Now, there are other light fixtures around the perimeter that are DCR owned, so we can't control or change those. Um, the specialty lighting at the War Memorial and basketball court will be different than the street lighting. And what we would add, these orange red dots going to Jersey Street or from Evans Way Bridge would be the street lighting standard light fixture. Um, Kevin was clarifying that it's the floodlights that many people object to. Yeah, there's floodlights at the footbridges and I would even consider what's at the War Memorial floodlighting. So um, the bridges we're gonna have to look at because there's a lot of glare there. Um, and then also, oh, I should have mentioned there's um, light fixtures up here in the Victory Garden, which we'll talk about in a minute, that are um, they're concrete poles with what we call cobra heads. They're kind of a uh, more of industrial light fixture, you know, with a metal arm. Thank you, Kyle. And then there was another question that was asking about the lights along row A of the Victory Gardens and whether those would be changed. And for those that aren't familiar with the Victory Gardens, um, it's the path parallel to Boylston from Park Drive to the Boylston Street Bridge. Yeah, that's these here. Um, and so there's um, a series of concrete poles that I was just referring to, and there's overhead wires. So the wires would be put underground and um, I think the intent is to replace those with the street lighting standard light poles. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate jumping back to that. Sure, no problem. So um, then a little bit more information on the Victory Garden. So we'll dive into this a little more specifically. I've already touched on the fact that the primary pathways here would be repaved. The one parallel to Boylston and Park Drive, the ones kind of spurring through the Victory Garden. And then the dashed one, which we used to kind of think of as the back to the back of the Victory Gardens when the Phragmites was here, um, is now going to be front and center. You know, it's a waterfront path. But this one actually is the most problematic because there's the most water. Um, it's the lowest. So we're going to look at that pretty seriously, probably look at um, soil borings and see how we can change the construction of it to be able to take the heavy traffic, heavy traffic in terms of load, maintenance, emergency vehicles, um, compost and trash collection, but also to be a really great pedestrian path. There's other parts of the Victory Garden to talk about other than paths. Well, I, before I get off the path topic, I mentioned this earlier that we're adding a few paths to an accessible garden, to the apiary and pollinator garden in the herb and medicinal garden. So these are all publicly accessible garden plots that um, need to be accessible. And um, then the only other kind of exception to some of the pathways are um, at the big willow tree in that same segment we were talking about lighting. We would do a flexible material there so that we wouldn't harm the willow roots, which are very shallow and um, high up. So some of the pathway widths are indicated here um, because the Victory Garden paths all have a little bit different character and a different need. You know, so the colors ranging from that gold all the way up to a dark blue show the range of widths from five feet up to 11 feet. And you know it's widest when we have to get maintenance vehicles, a vehicle to pick up a dumpster that's as far as here. Um, and then also would continue out. I'll talk about vehicular circulation in a minute, but also just um, the hierarchy of paths in terms of how many people use them, like those smaller paths that lead to those accessible garden plots or the publicly accessible garden plots normally need to be five feet wide, while other paths take more traffic and need to be a little bit wider. I mentioned vehicular access. Um, today, the way, um, a lot of vehicles enter the garden, and that's for trash pickup, construction, dumpsters, or even dropping off or picking up garden supplies. If you're a gardener, you come in at a curb cut right here at this intersection and come into the garden. But it's also a heavily pedestrian, uh, it's heavily used by pedestrians. So there's a conflict here. 
Um, plus, it's an awkward location to come in, particularly if you're a large vehicle. So we're suggesting no different than the way the Army Corps access this area, a curb cut could be added that would be used for that um, infrequent vehicular access. But it would be one way, so particularly like if you're a dumpster, if you're picking up a dumpster, you're coming in here, not at that intersection that's more um, problematic, coming in along the water to the dumpster location that would be here. And we've talked to the folks at the Fenway um, as part of the Victory Gardens and different dumpster locations had pros and cons, but this one is the most central for gardeners and doesn't get as much neighborhood traf trash as if it were in other locations. But that means that for that dumpster truck to get through here, this pathway has to be able to handle that loading and then be able to get out. So then we're gonna focus on, um, let me just step back for one second. We're gonna talk about this area that I was just referring to as not wanting to have vehicular access through here and it was really a gateway into the garden for a lot of people. So we're gonna talk about that. We've talked about it at past meetings, and I think the feedback we got was less is more. So I think you'll see that what we're proposing is dialed back quite a bit um, to just make improvements that would be well used, but not trying to be um, have too many components. So here are a few photos just showing existing conditions, um, a number of things that are important to take note of for the recommendations. There's a flagpole, there's an informational kiosk that's along a kind of rough gravel path, it's not accessible. Sandwich board to provide some information. There's a memorial um, with a stone here. There's a blue phone, trash barrel, and there's an entry garden. This translates into plan um, I'll orient to a few different things, but we started off here at Park Drive in Boylston. This is the pedestrian entrance that I mentioned. There would We would restrict vehicular traffic with a bollard, and I'll show you a rendering here in a minute on how we can celebrate in an understated way this entrance and the importance of the Victory Garden itself. We would replace this pathway because it's actually too steep right now, so we would regrade it to make that accessible, relocate that memorial stone that's here to the edge of this entry garden. We want to preserve this open lawn on either side of the pathway, but move the flagpole back just so that lawn is a little bit more open. And then the kiosk, make it accessible on one of these publicly accessible paths leading to the urban medicinal garden. And then widen the radius here and have the blue phone there um, to make this all fairly clean and open so it can um, be used for a lot of different purposes, you know, a, a larger group if need be, but also on a lot of days you'll see people sitting under, you know, trees in the shade, and this is a nice quiet respite from the busyness all around. So I mentioned that we would have a rendering um, talking about the proposed improvements to this entrance. My back would be to Park Drive in Boylston. This is the concrete path leading in. You can see the blue phone. The urban medicinal garden is here. Um, the flagpole is just obscured behind the tree there. And you're seeing the wear on the side of the paths, mainly from vehicles coming in. Uh, there, some of it could be um, shortcutting by foot traffic. Um, so we're suggesting that there's some kind of welcoming statement here in an orientation sign that also signal, identifies this as the Victory Garden, gives a little bit of historical information and that this crosswalk comes in and then there is a jog the way the existing path jogs today. It's not really a concern for pedestrian traffic. If vehicular traffic is removed from this, this it actually works great. And to, and to realign this path to be on axis with the crosswalk and the curb ramp actually would disturb a lot of vegetation. So we feel like this is a, a good approach. Now this band we have in the paving um, is an accent paver and we were showing that it would say Victory Gardens and it would say welcome in multiple languages so that people have a sense that this is you know, a public space that they're encouraged to enter. And there could be some orientation information and, and historical background on the origin of the Victory Gardens and um, what they are today. Then shifting gears to the O'Reilly Memorial, these are Kyle. existing, 
Yes. Sorry. Can we jump yeah. back to the Victory Gardens for a couple oh, sure. comments that were in the chat? Yeah. Um, there was a question that was, um, is there a reason why the drinking fountain is on the exterior of the garden as opposed to the interior? And I wanted to clarify um, and asked if there was a specific location that seemed like it might be better for the gardeners. And the response was that there's a water hookup near the current sign and that there used to be a water fountain there in the 70s. Um, could we talk a little bit about the, the drinking fountain location? Yep. Yeah, here we were thinking about it making it accessible for passersby because people walk, jog, bike, um, but it also would be accessible for gardeners versus just having it in the garden space. I mean, I, I would love to hear more thoughts on that. We do have water coming in to the site just off to where my hand is right now. So that's not really a limitation um, to where, you know, if we put a drinking fountain here, 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 we have water in this area. And Kyle, while we're here, what if we took a quick break from the presentation to see if there are any other comments or thoughts on the Victory Garden before we jump into the O'Reilly so nobody forgets any thoughts that they sure. have? So we're getting a few um, comments in the chat, but if you'd like to speak to, please just go ahead and raise your hand um, underneath that reactions button at the bottom. And we'd love to hear from you too. Marie, um, you should be able to unmute now. Uh, sorry, thank you. I was the one who put the comment in about the drinking fountain. I guess my comment would be, you know, as gardeners, we're discouraged from using our hoses to drink water. Um, we're also discouraged from leaving any trash and water bottles in the park. Um, there's hundreds of gardeners there all summer long working in their plot. So, and I think having a water fountain that is in the interior of the garden would give all of the gardeners and people like me a chance to fill up water bottles and things. So, I don't know. I, I guess I just want to weigh in for putting one in the interior of the garden if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And I know there are a few other people popped into the chat that said they agree with that. So thank you for bringing that up. And we'll definitely take a look at that. I'm, I'm guessing this is Pam with the Fenway Garden. Yes, sorry, I couldn't. No, no, that's okay. I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to say hi to Pam if that wasn't Pam. <laughs> thank you for unmuting me. First question is, will there be curb cuts at both ends of what we used to call the back road? So you'll come in down closer to the Agassiz Bridge and exit up closer to, I guess it's called the Boylston Street Bridge. Yes, that would be the intent. Okay. Um, second question is, I don't see a trash barrel in the entrance of the gardens. On the one hand, given the ugly 50-gallon um, oil drum that we have now, no trash barrel is an improvement. On the other hand, you know, people coming from the Red Sox games and whatever will, will surely have trash that will be, need to be disposed of as they enter. So I yeah, just... there would be one for sure, because we know that parks would um, add one regardless. So we'll make sure we have a location that we uh, want to propose. Okay, and I'd like a pretty one instead of the uh, oil drum. Yep. Um, third question is, if you go back along the back road again, we had strongly requested there, there not be benches next to people's gardens. I think it would make sense to put benches on the other side of the road where you could sit and look at the muddy river, but your back is not too, is not against a garden fence. The back against the garden fence is an invitation to climb over the fence, but both where you've got the V for um, accessibility, handicapped access, wheelchair access, um, and along the back road, provided it's not next to a garden fence, to have a couple benches wouldn't be a bad idea. So Pam, do you mean it could be like near the compost locations because those aren't garden spaces? Yeah, though I wouldn't want to sit there. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking more on the other side of the road with your back towards the road. Just maybe, I don't know if it needs a spur path or not, but just down, you know, where your hand is now or even closer to the muddy river. But isn't some of that fenced off? That is fenced off now. My understanding is that it's fenced off for two years during which the Muddy River Restoration Project contractor is guaranteeing the landscaping. And then that after that, it's the BPRD who decides whether it remains fenced off or not. I'm not positive of that, but I know that the two-year landscaping guarantee is, I'm positive of that. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Okay, and my other question is on one of these Zooms, you had a much more elaborate front entrance design and now it's much sim more simplified. I mean, there was like um, an asymmetric stone benches to sit there at the front entrance. Um, has that changed? And it was much more elaborate than that is my main question. And yep. this, okay, so this is a proposed design now. Yes, we, we, um, we talked internally with Boston Park staff and they felt like this was probably the, most in keeping with the overall Back Bay Fens design character and Emerald Necklace Parks in general. So of those ones we you saw, this was the one they felt was okay. the right level of intervention. Okay. And it also seemed to be the direction of the community members that we heard at the last meeting was that a lot of those other ones that were more designed didn't feel to the community like the right space and that 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 size of a gathering space wasn't needed in that area. Um, so we also wanted to pare it down from that perspective too. Okay, and I would add that I think a bench there that is not against a garden fence might make sense. You know, just a bench along that sidewalk somewhere along the, you know, where Boylston transitions to Park Drive on the edge of the Victory Gardens. Um, for those of us who, you know, for people who want to break but walking halfway to the gar halfway to their garden or to the gardens and then into the garden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Those are great. Those are great comments. Kevin just wrote, did I get my answer to row A lighting? I know we had talked before about how those are really, they look like lights that you see along a freeway. And I assume that the plan is to change them to something different. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, they would be the standard light you see in the park now, the, what we call acorns. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pam. Kristen, you should be able to unmute yourself now, too. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for all the work you're doing. I think it's fantastic. I just wanted to second the need for a, a bench where um, Pam was mentioning, either there or set back to where the, the current bulletin board is. There's so many older gardeners who really need to rest. And the, the key would be to do it in, maybe with a little shade. Uh, you know, so maybe maybe up front to the left, if there's shade right over there, that that could be really helpful in the summertime. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, it's a good point. We we did think about benches further in, like by the blue phone and the bulletin board, but we heard some concerns about that being not quite visible from the park drive sidewalk and some undesirable activities. So mm -hmm. uh, I think having it out here at this um, sidewalk probably would work well. Yeah, and it'll have shade, which I think in the middle of summer is uh, really helpful. Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate all those comments. Um, Kyle, while we're still in the garden, um, Marie had a comment, and if we could go back to the circulation diagram about the concern, she um, there's concern about the lack of vehicular access proposed for the internal part of the park, despite supporting the work on the rear path for contractors and dumpsters. Um, but am I correct that the dashed line, we also were assuming people could use, but that wouldn't be the main path? That's right. Yeah, because we're, we're imagining that the Boston Parks packer, you know, picks up trash would need to come through here. But also, I think, you know, if you've got your car and you need to drop off six bags of mulch or whatever it happens to be, I think that's perfectly appropriate. It's just we think this intersection is a bad place for cars to come in and out of. Chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and Pam, let's see. Yeah, one more comment there. Currently, people certainly drive on the dotted line section, but also along um, row A from the entrance. When you come in, you can turn left or right on BPRD pathway, pathways that are asphalt. Yes, where that hand is going all the way up to the top right. Um, and people drive along those. It, I don't think we need construction vehicle access, except perhaps for occasionally an arborist along there, but going to Home Depot, people would be driving there. Yep. Yeah, Kristen, um, we had discussed the Home Depot deliveries and those would have to come in on the back road and either be able to turn onto that dotted line or we would take delivery along the back road and have gardeners distribute it. Thank you. Any other um, Victory Garden comments while before we jump over to the O'Reilly? I think we're good, Kyle. Okay, and we can always come back. All right, so the O'Reilly, these are existing photos. And 
there's a few different things here we're concerned about. You know, it's safety and accessibility are the primary things, um, but we're always thinking about it in a lens of this is a historic place and historic um, elements. But the photo with these dimensions here are indicating that if you were in a wheelchair or um, you wanted a smooth surface without a grade change, you could only get to the memorial here, where there's a curb reveal the rest of the way, plus the sidewalk material, these kind of chunky um, granite pavers are difficult for people with mobility issues, strollers, whatever, um, and wouldn't comply with accessibility standards anyway. So there's some things we're trying to improve, and then there'll be other things as well as we go through this. This photo, this image is of existing conditions. So I was just pointing out the granite pavers, which are designated with this orange tone. The memorial itself is here. And then there's two granite benches here. So um, that's the traffic island crosswalk, and then the sidewalk would be here. So what are the other issues beside accessibility that we're seeing? One, that the sidewalk's too narrow for the volume of traffic, or at least the pattern of pedestrian traffic we see. Um, the whole space between the sidewalk and the roadway curb heading off the page is completely compacted from foot traffic, bikes, and maintenance vehicles. But a lot of people shortcut off the path and don't make it to the crosswalk. They're going to the traffic island. You know, they're shortcutting it. So we're seeing that on both sides. Um, and then also we're seeing some connection from the backside of this plaza to the path running here. And there's a little bit of a grade change here, but that's basically all compacted soil now because people are making that connection without a path. There's some preservation issues with the benches themselves. They need to be cleaned from some staining and graffiti. There's some cracks and things that can be done to make them um, more stable. So then what are we recommending? There's a bit of a summary here with some bullet points. We're gonna remove those granite pavers so that we can have a smooth accessible surface, have an accessible route on both sides of the plaza here and here with the curb would still remain, but be reset so that we can have those um, flush connections. We would add stairs to the backside to make a connection to that path to provide an alternate access. And the path is widened. The existing is dashed here. So we're widening it to accommodate one, a maintenance vehicle that can make this perimeter route, but also the volume of traffic and the desire lines heading toward this crosswalk are accommodated. So any thoughts on O'Reilly before we go to the War Memorial? There's a question about the um, the, the Cobra lighting that came, that is at the O'Reilly, um, and those, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, are the DCR lights. The DCR light, and there's a floodlight on it that faces or highlights the the monument. So we're we're in a lot of conversations with DCR about you know all of our overlapping scope. So we're definitely happy to bring that up with them in terms of the fact that we're hearing that people don't like those, and if we could switch over um, to be more consistent with the rest of the park, that that would be something that the community is interested in. So we can absolutely bring that up for sure. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna. I'm going to go back and forth between people and chat questions. So, Marie, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, and then we'll take another chat? I do. I'll try and be quick. Um, this is really exciting. I'm very happy to see it. My concern, so we at Fenway Civic, we're really happy to be able to get some funding for this part, primarily because of the access issues around there. But I think the, the funding that we wanted to secure incorporated also some landscaping up grades and then also potential uplighting of the sculpture. So my first question is whether that is still planned for as well as part of this. And then secondly, just observing the accessibility, which I think looks so highly improved. The only thing I worry about is we have a lot of bikes now and scooters and skateboards and everything. And I imagine with a beautiful entry in and out of things with stairs, like I would hate to see it be used for jumps and things like that. Is there a way to provide that accessibility while also 
putting in some tactile things to discourage other types of uses? Yeah, it's a good point. It's something we'll have to look at because, I mean, we could make, because we've made the stairs fill the gap between the benches. So they're a little bit more gracious and allow people to kind of go in either direction. Um, and we have handrails on either side. I, I think we'll have to study that to see if there is a way to limit the, you know, the jumping or, you know, whatever else may happen because of the potential there. Thank you, Kyle. And just going back and forth between the um, the chat, there was a question that says, what color pavement and can it be light? Yeah, generally the sidewalks would be concrete and we think the plaza would be as well, you know, so it would be all similar material. The, the other, uh, Marie asked a couple other questions that we didn't answer, oh, the sorry. uplating or the landscaping. I, I think the landscaping would definitely be part of this and we have to develop that a little bit further. Um, there's a lot more shade here now than when this, if, I don't have the historic photo in the slides here, but um, there was quite a bit of perimeter planting. And I think we'd have to be cautious with the perimeter planting anyway, from a visibility standpoint and that kind of thing. The uplighting is something that Lauren, we'd have to talk about a little bit more in terms of who would maintain it, um, particularly if it was in the ground, which is, you know, it's a great way to accent statues, but it's also, the place where lights are most vulnerable to either vandalism or water intrusion. So I yeah. think that's something we'd have to dig into a little bit more. Right. Marie, I think that would be a question sort of like we did at Symphony Park in terms of how does how does something that's out of the ordinary get um, get maintained? But those are good questions for sure. Um, I'm going to unmute Anna and while we are give her the opportunity to unmute and while we're doing that, there was also a question that asked if we could go back to the previous slide. I'm not sure which slide we were on when that came up. So we're going to try this one. And Rachel, if this isn't the one you wanted to see, just let us know. Um, Anna, are you able to unmute? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I am curious, just because I travel through this intersection as a cyclist, it's one of the only safe ways to get from the Fenway area of Boylston Street towards the back bay. Um, and I love to hear that those stones are going to get removed. I think that'll be nice to make a wider path for everyone. And I'm just curious, you know, what is going to be put in place to help cyclists and pedestrians coexist safely? Because um, I think, you know, having clear signage or indication of where people should be, you know, trying to be. Um, I'm also just curious with, I've attended some of the, or I guess the uh, Booker overpass meeting, and there doesn't seem to be a strong plan for cyclists in this area. So just curious if you have any insight to that as well. So I can start, and <clears throat> Lauren, feel free to chime in. Um, we've had a number of conversations with DCR, who own this perimeter path, including their um, trails and greenways coordinator. And, you know, they don't have any current capital projects for upgrading the perimeter path. But I think, you know, as we brainstormed and walked them around, they could definitely see, you know, this needs to have an upgrade in terms of thinking about this from contemporary needs for multi-use, bicycles, pedestrians, all the e-devices, so it's on their mind. I just don't know where it is in their capital program. And just to um, expand on that a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about some of those DCR paths a little bit further um, in the presentation. But um, like Kyle said, the because of the property ownership, Boston Parks is not allowed to spend city money on other people's property. Um, so we are working on that coordination and there's going to be some things on DCR's property that will be done as part of this project through a collaboration. But the amount that needs to be done is not something that could be funded out of Boston Parks um, capital funding. Um, but we have been also working with DCR to see what they do have in their um, possible budgets for future years. But we've also been coordinating with the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, who is um, trying to see if they can help with some funding to try to see if we can do it all at once as well. So there have been a lot of those conversations in the background trying to help with some of those things Kyle was just talking about. Um, and then, Steve, you're actually the next 
comment in the chat and the next person with your hand raised. So I'm just going to let you ask your question in person if you want to do that. Hi, um, I'll add my thanks. There's clearly a lot of thought that has gone into this. I'm actually going to reverse my questions because the last one I had was about at one point in this process, there was discussion of adding a speed table to the crosswalk there to the traffic island. I just wonder if that's still uh, under consideration. That's one. Two, uh, the width of the path is, is the suggestion. It sounds like, in fact, it's gonna hinge on DCR deciding to do this. Um, where you widen that path along Boylston Street is the idea just to completely eliminate the strip next to the street, which is now completely free of vegetation because it's so trampled down. Um, and Or if that's not the case, are there, there is some point at which presumably the wider path along Boylston Street will get narrower to get closer to what the path is continue as it continues along Boylston. So what is the thinking about where that might narrow? And then the final question, sorry, to, to cram, cram them all in. Um, there is one of the lovely 50 gallon barrels that Pam referred to earlier behind the benches <laughs> that is um, often full. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's, if the plan is to maintain some kind of trash and hopefully a recycling bin together. I know the city does that on the common. Don't see why they couldn't do it here. <clears throat> so speed table, width of the paths, and trash barrel. All right, let me start with the speed table and the width of the paths. The speed table was um, not necessarily a speed table. It was, we were trying to figure out different ways to make this plaza accessible. And one way to do it was to get rid of the curb, make the sidewalk and plaza all at the same grade. But to do that, the curb ramp and the road would have to come up a bit. It wasn't going to be abrupt to be like a speed table. But it got that was very involved in terms of cost and intervention. So we felt like, and again, this isn't controlled by city of Boston. Okay. So by containing this, you know, even some of this is DCR land, this is a little bit easier to achieve and still have a good result. Then the width of the sidewalk, we've got a dimension here, 14 and a half. You can see the dashed line, which is the existing. We are maintaining a bit of that landscape strip acknowledging that it's still going to get worn but we do have furnishings and other things um, and we're also hopeful that with the widened path that maybe it'll take some of the pressure off of that your question also about you know where does this taper back that's something we have to coordinate with dcr because our funding you know we're going to want to taper this back fairly quickly because we can't you know extend this all the way to the boylston street bridge um, but we're hopeful that DCR could pick up with this and um, do a little bit more planning in their own respect to see, you know, how they accommodate all the different modes and needs in the volume of traffic here. The trash barrel question, you know, I think you're right. There is one that moves around somewhere in this area, you know, that we could formalize a location that could be a more attractive one that had a permanent pad and would be easily accessible for pickup. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you can comment on the recycling component. Yeah, un unfortunately, I don't have any updates on that. It's something that I'm continuing to try to push within parks as well. Um, it's something that we don't currently have, and we're working to roll that out. And unfortunately, there just isn't an update of when that's happening yet. Thanks. Um, Kristen, I think you're the next one, if you can unmute. Sure, thanks. This is kind of a small thing, but uh, I just noticed a big problem in that triangle area of those, I don't know what the right word is for those, the ramp plates, you know, that are right on the, the accessible. Detectable warnings. Okay, mm -hmm. detectable warnings. Um, I contacted 311 so many times about those that they were broken for like years, really. Finally got replaced recently, but you can tell they're going to break soon. I, so the question is, are these going to be put in other places during this whole path restructuring? And if so, I hope it's going to be a different material or different 
um, solution than what's been used in that triangle area because it's been or just horrendous. Yeah, that's a great question. And Kyle, you can talk about where they would be installed, but um, there's a new um, there's an, a new mandate, if that's the right word to put it, um, from the city of Boston that our detectable warning strips are now going to be metal. And I think because of that concern of where they had been failing mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, so that's the new standard for anything that the city puts in. I can't comment on any of the state um, owned portions um, or the sidewalks, the state owns, but when the city does a project, we put in um, the metal ones now. And that's just been, been within the last couple of months that that change happened. Um, but Kyle, you could probably talk about where else in the park um, we might be looking at putting in some detectable warning strips. Yeah. So on, on this plan, here's a curb ramp and we would re be replacing the detectable warning panel. It's a DCR owned uh, curb ramp. So we'd have to coordinate with them to see what they would want installed. And every other curb ramp that we would have as part of this project would be on DCR land. So it's a conversation we need to have. Great. Thank you. Um, Kathleen. Hi. Um, thanks. This looks really good. There's so many things that um, I really like since the last time. The meadow and the bench placements, um, the bike rack placements by the bridges. It's great the grade around the steep hill um, and was excited to see the tree inventory. I wanted to talk about the bike access and um, getting around this area. I really feel like we need to move the bike paths to the north side of Boylston Street and off this excessively heavy pedestrian use side, especially by from O'Boyle up to the top top section um, where you're crossing over, you know, to Boylston inbound. It is so intensely um, traffic pedestrian wise. Uh, so I'm like thinking at the, the top right corner. Um, yeah, like in towards the Bowker um, overpass. Like if we could shift the bike use to the north side of Boylston and everyone's going through the garden. This is where people are walking into the Fenway. You know, residents are coming from Northeastern and um, the East Fen's going to the West. Right around the Boyle, uh, O'Boyle Riley, that is just so congested with pedestrians. If we could, if we could get the bikes on the other side of Boylston, I think it would um be a lot safer for everyone and the you know the the wheeled vehicles they do go a lot faster um it would be safer for all involved so i would hope we can consider that well that's something that we did talk to dcr about because they own park drive um mm -hmm. and they have a parkways master plan that includes the fenway and i think park drive so they have concepts that show lane reductions and bike accommodations. But like I said earlier, even about their perimeter path, they don't have anything programmed in their capital program. So I think it's one of those things that like Lauren mentioned, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy is hoping to, you know, put, connect more of these projects or even to advocate for more funding for the things that are outside of this scope. Yeah, and we, you know, this the Bowker um, conversation is going on now as well. Yep. So, yeah, exactly, and that's yeah. that's why. Yeah, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy is trying to make sure all of those different different projects are all talking to each other, so that yeah. some of those conflicts can can try to be addressed through the projects. Mm -hmm. Great. Absolutely. Um, and and then that, I that that would be my top concern on all of this. Just it is a safety issue, but it, it's looking fantastic. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Um, and then Kyle, I think we're caught up in the chat on okay. comments for the Victory Garden in O'Reilly. And if there is something that you put in the chat that I missed, there were a lot coming in. I apologize. So please feel free to stick it back in there um, and we'll get back to it if I missed it somewhere. Right. All right. We're going to shift gears and talk about the War Memorial. So here are existing photos of the War Memorial. Um, some a little bit older because I think this one showing the temporary ramp that's been removed since we took the photo. But um, as I mentioned, this is owned by the Boston Trust Office. It was built with funds from the White Fund. I think it opened in 1948. 
Um, it was originally a World War II memorial. There's been additions to um, both the Korean War and Vietnam War. But why are we talking about it as part of this project? One, the pathways leading to the side of it will be reconstructed. And then the trust office um, was thinking about addressing accessibility and the pathway conditions and the, the memorial in general. So it started, it became part of this project. So as we started to look at it, there's a number of different things just from a pathway condition. You know, the bluestone paths are in okay condition, but there's a lot of issues, um, accessibility issues, the joints, you know, being tripping hazards. But then you start to look at it more carefully. And, you know, why is this temporary ramp here? It's because there is no accessible route to multiple levels of the memorial. So that's when we started to dive into a little bit more. So how do we make the need for a temporary ramp go away and make this a seamless accessible experience and address all the condition issues? So this is something that we have studied a lot. Um, there's 15 different options we're showing here. I think there were more than this. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I, I think the I, what I wanna convey is that if you look at the any one of these, the existing memorial is this white triangle. It's the raised plinth. There's a circular wall with a podium and then these radiating spoked paths leading to another outside path and then the Korea and Vietnam memorials, the Rose Gardens off here to the side. So we basically looked at three different strategies. You know, options one, two, three, four, and six are a little bit more like retrofits. How can we create a path to go to the upper level and the inner, the lower level in an accessible way. But those have an Achilles heel that if you get to one of those levels, you have to reverse course to go to the other level. And that doesn't seem very practical. And you may have separated with someone who's able-bodied and can traverse the stairs and that kind of thing. So we are thinking more about universal access. So we looked, we created options five, eight, and nine, which allow you I'll focus on option five. You can go from this outer pathway and then choose to go to the upper level, but you can also choose to go back to the lower level or you know back and forth. So that works, but it still feels a little complicated and added on. So then we started to color outside the lines a little bit more and say, what if instead of maintaining the levels of the walls and the pathways as they are today. What if we reset some things to remove some of the, the level changes? And that's what these six options on the side are. We start to raise the grade to remove stairs and simplify the access. So I'll walk you through three of these examples to give you a sense of some of the major design differences. Um, and I'll also give you a sense of the feedback we've gotten from the Landmarks Commission, from the Trust Office, and from the Disabilities Commission. So this first option is one of the ones that I mentioned um, provides access to the upper level and to the lower level. So there's stairs here today and stairs here. So these paths are alternative routes to avoid those stairs. But as I mentioned, if you were entering the War Memorial, one person in a wheelchair, one walking, the wheelchair, well, all of the group could take this route um, but if you wanted to go to the other level, you have to reverse course to go to the other level. Or your group may split, someone taking the stairs, someone not. So it's got some issues. This shows you in three dimensions the addition of these two paths shown in that lighter color. All the darker color paths are existing. And basically, the way that works is we provide an alternate path to avoid these stairs. And then the upper part of the memorial, there's stairs on either side. Stairs would remain on one side and we would fill over them in another. So in historic preservation, we like to have reversible solutions. So if philosophy changes, you can remove this path and the stairs would still be there. So then this option starts to think about, well, what if we raised the grade of this circular wall and this whole area to get rid of those stairs that exist today? And then you only need a path to get you to this upper location. So this simplifies it quite a bit. You can have stairs on one side that preserve kind of that elevated appearance of the monument from the Rose Garden side. 
but then there's this very simple and short path that gets you up to that level in only one level. So when you see it here, it's fairly subtle um, that we fill the stairs in that location with this path. Now, what that does though, is by raising this center circle, these lawn panels then slope from a higher point here to a lower point on the outer edge. So if you think of this with a large crowd, like an amphitheater, it's working almost backwards. So it's not great if you're standing here and someone's in front of you, if you're trying to see a presentation. So then we looked at another option where we broke the rules even more. Um, when I say broke the rules, we're spending more money. So um, here's a case where we can, yes, raise that center circle and regrade the paths, but then have the lawn panels still work from a crowd perspective. And to do that, you have to add walls to the outer edges of these lawn panels. So the three-dimensional view show that more, um, more accurately. We have paths that now lead to the memorial itself. The memorial is extended, so there's an accessible route to the podium. The paths are all accessible, and the lawn panels remain flat or slightly sloping inward with these walls that retain the grade. And they actually could be engraved for um, identifying you know, more recent conflicts or wars or some other memorialization. Um, and as you've, if you noticed from image to image, we've kept these benches here, but there's access to the lawn panels and we've removed this bench. So there's access to the lawn panel as well. So it's um, a summary of a lot of, a lot of work we've done on the war memorial. I mentioned, you know, what are the feet, what's the feedback we've gotten? Generally um, those, those first options that I mentioned that were get you to each level, but don't connect are not viewed as well, um, even though they're you know less expensive, but don't really provide universal access or you know or is practical either. Um, these options that start to raise the grade are more preferred from the Disabilities Commission and the Trust Office. Um, Landmarks has not seen this last one yet, but we're trying to have a meeting soon with Conservation Commission, Landmarks, Disabilities, and the Trust Office all at once so we can talk about everyone's different viewpoints. I mentioned the fill, but I didn't talk about the viewpoint of the Conservation Commission. So as we bring in fill to make all this happen and remove these barriers, we're filling in floodplain. So we're gonna have to compensate and excavate in other locations local to the memorial that will be equivalent to whatever fill we place. Um, and we've done that study, it's all doable, um, but you know, this is, as you can tell, as we've gone through the presentation tonight, this is probably the most complicated aspect of the project at this point, because there's so many competing factors from preservation, accessibility, and um, environmental issues. Well, the one thing I did just want to say um, is that when Kyle was talking about the fact that we have not um, run all of this by Landmarks and Conservation Commission yet, um, we have had a lot of meetings with the trust office um, because this is their um, property. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations with the Disability Commission. And we've also had conversations with the Veterans Commission. Um, and all three of those um, groups have been very um, impressed with this option 3NR, which is you know what we're hearing in the chat. People seem to be um, very in favor of as well. Um, so what we wanted to do is be able to, you know, get sort of a consensus from those groups, talk to the community, make sure that, you know, everyone that we're talking to here seems to be on the same page. Um, and then that way, whenever we have that broader conversation with Landmarks and Conservation Commission, we've been able to have all of that input from all of those groups so that we can we can all um, come together on this. But like Kyle said, it's very complicated and has a lot of... Um, We've come a long way with it, but we still have all that permitting to get through as well. Um, and we also had a question in the chat um, that is, can you remind us of the lighting plan for that space? Yep. Yeah, so we want to replace the floodlights that, the two floodlights that exist now, because one, they're out of date and they're also like inappropriate for this kind of space. They were there. I mean, it's, it's floodlighting that provides you know, improved safety. 
Now we haven't gotten into all the details of it yet because I think there's so many variables we're looking at otherwise, but I think we wanna have area lighting and you know we like architectural accent lighting as well, but that's a conversation we'll have to have with landmarks, but of course the trust office who owns the property and would maintain it. And, and there was a question about whether we should do a poll in the chat. And I think what I would love to, um, what I would love to just say is if anyone has any concerns about this plan, if they could let us know what the concerns are, um, because so far everything that I've seen um, has been very positive in the chat. And then, you know, there was just a comment about um, somebody who had attended a, you know, a, an event here. And one of the things that we heard from the Veterans Commission is they don't use this. Um, they don't hold events here anymore. They haven't for years. And the reason is because so many of the vets can't use it. And so they were very excited about the idea of us making this so that they can come back to start using this again, which is fantastic. Any other thoughts, concerns, um, questions on the Roar Memorial? And, and I agree, Richard and Steve, that's one of the things we really wanted this to be was to not feel like an afterthought and not feel like a retrofit and to really see if we could make this space feel and look like it fits here and it's respectful of everybody that wants to be able to use it. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. We're almost there. Um, so um, this is a slide you've seen before where I talk about who owns what paths. The orange, the gold color is city of Boston and then the red around the perimeter is DCR. And I'm doing this because we wanna talk about what improvements this project can do on DCR property and why. Um, the, as you can imagine, like if we're trying to improve pathways from Jersey Street toward Evans Way Bridge or toward Forsyth Street, but that accessible that curb ramp is inaccessible, that kind of messes up our plan, you know, because then we have an inaccessible connection to something we're improving. So there are multiple curb ramps, there's some puddles and other poor condition pathways that would not would leave us with an incomplete accessible route in and out of the park that we feel like we have to address. And we've talked to DCR about as a minimum and that they would allow us to do that work. So as a lead into this diagram, it's um, same orientation and same graphic we've been showing, except all of the park is in black and white. There's a few things I'll point out. The things that pop out at you are these red rectangles. These are the areas that Boston Parks would in, do improvements on DCR land to make those accessible routes complete. Um, and I'll talk about each one of them, but I'll explain a couple other things with this diagram. These blue dots and this blue line are pretty significant puddles. Um, and I'll start with the dots. I mean, these are isolated puddles, but they cross the whole path basically, or most of it. Um, if we have a red box around it, it, it covers the whole path and you can't get around it. So we feel like we need to fix that. Um, but we're also, we've conveyed all this to DCR so that hopefully they can do some interim repairs, let alone a larger project. The um, blue line is that stone dust path that has granite curbs on each side that really doesn't have good drainage relief. So when it rains or when snow melts, it's more of a canal than a pathway. And you'll see the wear and tear on either side of that because people avoid the wet spots and go to higher ground. Now that's not something we can tackle. I mean, that's a fairly big project on its own, um, but we've talked to DCR about it. They understand the issues and um, it's something that um, they wanna look into. These orange dashed lines and the red dashed lines are areas where the pavement is in poor or um, you know, poor condition or inaccessible. So that's why these red boxes are identif identifying areas that we need to improve to make our accessible routes complete. And that's the last slide I have. So we can go back and talk about anything in general, or we can talk about next steps.
Marie, you should be able to unmute. Um, thanks again. This is a lot. Uh, it was a huge presentation and super exciting to be able to see it. I have a few questions and comments about things, some of which weren't talked about and some which were. Um, so I'll just go by area. In the Victory Gardens, there is one place um, on the rear path as you're approaching the Boyle Street, Boylston Street Bridge that has a grouping of trees. And there's currently a problem with vehicles parked in and around tree roots. So I guess one of my questions is, are you planning to implement any type of measures around those areas to protect trees? So that's one question. Um, secondly, when you're showing the improvements that you plan for the Agassiz Road intersection of the Back Bay Fens, it made me remember that we were talking about the Burns Monument and how there was a low heat wall at that area, and also how some of the trees are um, old and not in great shape. So I think my specific questions there is whether you're planning on retaining either the low wall or implementing any seeding there and if you're planning to do new tree planting. And my last comment is on design area two, where you had the meadow pop up during the fencing period. I believe that that's an area that we planted with three willow oaks a long time ago. I think the willow oaks are doing well. So I just wanted to confirm that those um, trees will remain in the meadow treatment of what you're planning. Thank yep. you. Great. So let me take those one by one. Um, tree protection. So I think tree protect. There's two kinds of tree protection. Tree protection during construction, so that contractors through the construction work don't impact trees. And then the other is like you were describing, where you know cars tend to park under trees for shade, that kind of thing. So I think that we'll have to look at more to see what can be either built in or, and if we want to build in something to kind of manage that. And I'll have to look at those specific trees. I know what you're talking about. Um, so I'll have to look at that. The burn statue and the seat wall near there. Um, so the burn statue is roughly where my hand is. And then there's a mortared stone wall close to Agassiz Road. It's almost, there's a concrete pad. It looks like you're, you might park there. And then there, at the head of where you would park would, is a wall. And this is a wall that does, it's not historic. We've looked at Olmstead plans, Shercliffe plans. We asked Margaret Dyson about it. We looked at more recent plans. And um, generally, it could even be from the 70s, but generally, the feeling is it can be removed. Now, seating in that area, I think we'd have to look at our plans for proposed benches and I know I've seen the historic photo of the Burns Monument the first time it was here. And I think there was a bench very close to it. So, and this is a great location in terms of view of the river and their shade. So I think that's a good location for benches. I think the condition of the trees is an important thing to talk about um, because I know some big limbs have come down in trees here in this area. Um, but like I said, we have a tree inventory that's been done that outlines recommendations for all the trees along the pathways. So that's something that we're gonna coordinate with Boston Parks Arborist to see what gets incorporated into this project or what maybe would be done outside of the project. And then the willow oaks, we would um, keep the willow oaks. There's no reason to remove those. Is that all of those? I don't wanna jump in before you were done. That covered all of them, right, Kyle? Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question in the chat um, that was asking about would the benches be age friendly? Um, and yes, we do make sure that our benches do meet that age friendly. Um, we They have backrests and they have armrests. Um, we also make sure that they um, have a companion space next to them for wheelchairs as well. Um, so thank you for asking that one, Leslie. Um, I appreciate that for sure. Um, and then Pam, I think you're next if we get have you unmute. Okay, so first of all, thank you both so much. This has been really wonderful. Um, some questions, I don't know if it's relevant, but I'm wondering if the tree map included the Arbor Day plantings on the edge of the Victory Gardens. And Jack from ENC is, I think, still on the Zoom and could give you that info if you need it. Hi, Jack. 
Um, my next question was, is there a bike rack included in the Victory Gardens um, redesign? And if so, where? Good question. So the I'll start with the trees. I think um, I gotta actually double check to see if we would have included those. We're certainly aware of them. We work with Emerald and Eccles Conservancy all the time. So um, I'm aware of that new planting. I don't think we would have had those inventoried, but I'll double check that. And then the question of the bike rack, I am thinking if we do have a bike rack proposed. I don't see one. So if you have a thought in terms of where it would be used or could be used, that would be good to know. Okay. I mean, I need to think about that as well. The other thing we've talked about removing our current bulletin board there, it seems to me that we need to have a place, and I don't know if it's FJS or BPRD that would install it up for a accessible bulletin board. One that's, you know, is that thigh height where where we can also change the material that's in it. Yep, we actually have a location shown here. Um, if you can see my cursor, yep. um, it's off the main path so it wouldn't get hit, but it's accessible because it's on pavement and it would be leading to the urban medicinal garden, but still very much front and center as people were coming into the garden. Okay. And, and so Pam, oh, I was gonna say, Pam, as we start to get further into details when we're figuring out exactly what that bulletin board looks like, we can make sure to loop um, you all in so that we make sure that it meets the needs that you have for usability. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, we had talked about putting meadow grass between the DCR sidewalk uh, along Boylston Street and the back fence of the gardens. Is that still part of the plan? Yes, and thanks for mentioning that. We did, in, um, you know, because we had so much to cover anyway, there were some details I didn't get into and kind of organizing and adding a fence to the compost areas and some of the meadow areas you mentioned that would be between the Park Drive Boylston sidewalk and this um, row A, um, there are some opportunities to convert turf grass to meadow. So thanks for mentioning that. Great, I love that idea. So thank you so much for that one. Um, this is this kind of off the wall question, but we've asked um, about, there's apparently a universal Wi-Fi in the city program going on. And I don't know what that takes, but to be able to get Wi-Fi in the gardens would be wonderful. And I don't know if that goes into your wiring plan or where it happens, um, but let me just throw that one out. We've asked, um, there's been some correspondence with Maggie Von Squay, um, mm -hmm. but nothing's happened beyond the correspondence. Um, Finally, um, the dumpster disguise, are there any details on that or you know, how we would basically beautify compost, maybe add signage to make it educational um, and hide the dumpster a little bit? Yeah, I think the details of it we need to work out. I, I think we talked about just um, a fence, you know, it's a transparent fence, not dissimilar from the garden plot fencing. Um, but I think we need to dig into that a little bit more and we can, um, discuss that more. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. And Jack, can you unmute? Yes, hi. And I'll be real quick because I know we're, we're already pretty late. Thanks so much for the time. I had a few quick questions and points and they can be responded to offline if that's easier. Um, but Kyle, if you could go back to that one other map you had that showed the paths and which ones were put in by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, yep. I know We'd sent in some communications about, you know, advocating for stabilized stone dust pathways. And I believe the Army Corps ones are stone dust, but I don't know if they ever stabilize those. So I just want to flag that as perhaps a factor for like longer term maintenance for the Boston team, because I know that can be a bit of a problem when they're not stabilized. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. I also know that it's DCR property, but there's a lot of interest in bikes being able to go um, both directions on Agassiz Road and like through that way. So I hope that we can continue that conversation. And then I appreciate all the talk about the O'Reilly Monument. And I'm curious if there are any opportunities still for any investment in the soil and the trees behind that on the Mother's Rest hillside. Um, I'm happy to support some of that from the Conservancy's end, but it would be great to know what you all have cooking. So thanks for everything. 
Yeah, so thanks, Jack. Um, I'll start with the stone dust. I came back to this um, diagram. So these green paths are ones that the Army Corps reconstructed. And I think they may have done this one since we created that diagram. But they did just put stone dust down. Um, no matter what the slope, you know, I think they're fairly flat in most of these areas and then it starts to pick up some grade um, and stabilize. Adding a stabilizer can help limit erosion and, um, you know, improve maintenance, but it still has limitations. You know, we've used stabilized stone dust for, I would say, maybe 100 miles of it, you know, in different applications. and it always has the Achilles heel of the spring thaw. So January, February, March, when it's going from frozen to unfrozen, the stabilizer does not prevent rutting um, or, you know, kind of water bubbling up. But, it, you know, it's something we do propose for a lot of sites um, because it still is um, mainly permeable, um, generally accessible, and can, you know, ease maintenance. The... Um, Biking on Agassiz, we've heard different things from DCR. I don't know if what the final result is. Um, we've The last thing I heard from Jeff Parenti, who I know has left DCR, was that they were going to close the road to vehicular traffic, and there was an opportunity for a bike lane or maybe even two-way. But that was not a done deal because they were still trying to figure out what the emergency vehicle access requirements were going to be. Um, and I think ultimately then that was a negotiation to what would the Army Corps build? And I don't have the final answer. I don't know, Lauren, if you've heard anything different. No, that's the latest that I had heard as well. I know that those conversations are still happening, but I haven't heard anything definitive. Yep. And then, Jack, your last question about the slope and the soils and the trees by the O'Reilly, that's something that's still in our mind. And I think as we advance the designs after tonight, that's something we're going to look into and see you know, how far can the money go and what can we do? Because there are some things that we haven't gotten in a lot of detail yet, or we haven't even um, shared, you know, tree planting, we touched on in a few locations, you know, the um, tree work. Um, so I think that is a level of detail that will be coming soon. Thank you, Kyle. And um, Kyle, we've got one more slide <laughs> about our next steps. Just want to be respectful of everybody's time too. Um, so yeah, so we just want, I wanted to say thank you to everybody. I know this is a lot of information and I appreciate you sticking it out with us. Um, and I, and like Kyle said, I know we didn't get to everything, um, every little detail, but we wanted to at least let you guys know where we were and what we have been working on since we talked last. Um, so next, like Kyle said, we're going to take all this feedback and start to finalize the designs and jump into the permitting and approvals um, and then start to work on our construction documents so that we can bid this. Um, we also are going to continue to work on the Evans Way Bridge, which we didn't talk about tonight. Um, and because that's a much more complex um, beast with permitting and with landmarks and with funding um, that hasn't been allocated yet that's not going to continue on that same pathway um, at the same time as the rest of the project. So everything we've talked about tonight is going to kind of be like, think of it as phase one. Um, and then the bridge is going to end up being phase two. So we'll continue to work on that. And then what we'll do is in a couple of months, our hope is to be able to come back for what will be the final pathways meeting um, to talk about this is what we're actually doing. These are the final decisions. Here's the time frame, the schedule, all of those things. And then to give you an update as to how the Evans Way Bridge is progressing. Um, so again, really appreciate everybody's time tonight. Um, and you know, the presentation will be on the website. And if you think of anything or have any other questions, feel free to email me as well. So thank you everybody. Really, really appreciate your time. <laughs>